Thank you very much. Uh, you know, hope you had a uh, really great lunch uh, and a great opportunity to network. Uh, we're going to uh, kick off our uh, second half of our session uh, with a uh, fireside chat. Uh, we don't unfortunately have a fire uh, uh, burning here. We were told uh, we weren't allowed to, but uh, just imagine uh, you know, some flames going up on the uh, slides. Uh, and uh, Bill Alouette, who's the managing director of the uh, Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship, will be having a conversation with uh, Brad Peterson. Uh, Brad's currently executive vice president and the uh, chief information officer for his NASDAQ. So if you want to understand you know, uh, financial tech as it applies to the uh, financial industry, we've got nobody better uh, than here. Uh, but uh, beyond uh, NASDAQ, I think uh, Brad's going to give a uh, really a unique perspective uh, because he's had a wide uh, background. He has been the CIO at eBay uh, for five years. Before that, he was managing director and CIO for Epic Securities, uh, which was bought out by uh, Goldman Sachs. And uh, before then, he uh, actually had uh, senior positions both at uh, Pac, uh, you know, Pac Bell Wireless and Pac uh, Telesis, now AT&T. So when we discuss networking effects, you know, it can really mean everything from uh, what we understand from a management perspective, networking effects, down to the microstructure of networks in those last five microseconds that makes, uh, uh, makes, makes or breaks, uh, you know, for exchanges. Uh, it's going to be a great uh, uh, chat, and I uh, turn it over to uh, the team. Thank you very much. Um, well, something is missing, and we just... As entrepreneurs, we never accept that we can't make the impossible happen. So there we go. <laughs> so um, I am not a fintech expert, uh, nor am I a fire expert. I'm an entrepreneurship. I'm an entrepreneur. And uh, what we're going to talk about is the manus part of the mens amanus. You've heard real intellectuals here talking to you today, like Simon, Antoinette, Christian Catalini. We're pseudo-intellectuals here, uh, and we're going to talk about how you implement all this stuff. That was a joke, okay? Just let's, let's, <laughs> let's warm up a little bit here, all right? Um, but I just want to say one thing before we start. Um, I want to th thank the people who put this on, because this took a lot. And uh, where's Chris and her team and Kathy? Can you stand up? And Donna, can you just stand up? They are. And they really do an enormous amount of this. And last night we had a demo day as well elsewhere in, in uh, New York, and they really helped with that. And um, I'll say a little bit about that. But what's going on at MIT is we did a whole bunch of work in the energy sector, and it turned out to be fabulously successful. And now what we're looking to do is replicate that in the fintech area. And what we did is we got a gift and we, and we applied that to creating a thing called a practice leader. And we have a fintech practice leader. We had one last year named Carlos Altable Sanchez, or San Carlos Altable Sanchez. And he did a terrific job at setting it up. And now this year we have Arturo. Where are you, Arturo? Can you stand up? And his job is to, he's a current student. He's a current student, and he connects everything that's going on at MIT and outside of MIT, including Harvard Law School, and um, other places that are relevant, including alumni. So Arturo is a great resource, and that's his job, to figure out how do we create this vibrant ecosystem of MIT entrepreneurs in the fintech area. So um, that's it. The one last thing I want to say is Demo Day. How many of you were at Demo Day last night? How was it? What did you think? No, it wasn't, it wasn't terrific. It was either epic or legendary. <laughs> Those are the only two choices. Which one was it? Good, that's right. <laughs> no, we, we bring our students down here. And as you know, the students are the best thing that we have at MIT. And they, they put on a show of shows as to what's going on, they include FinTech. Two of them were FinTech. So if you want to get an invitation, please, for next year's, we, we want to increase our connections to New York City. Please see me. Give me your card, if you still do business cards. Um, but we would love to invite you we, to be and connected. And we may try and host it at the NASDAQ market. And, and we may try to host yeah. it at the NASDAQ market. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's the preamble. And um, so Brad and I are going to talk. And one of the interesting things, Brad said, are you going to tell them about our relationship? Uh, we went to the same high school and played sports together. And, um, well, different sports. He played a real sport, football, and I played basketball. 
which we try to avoid contact. He kind of like, boom. <laughs> and, that was uh, actually better in lacrosse. So. Better in yeah. lacrosse. And uh, by the way, interestingly, it's, it's the Horace Greeley High School, the home of the fighting Quakers. And um, <laughs> we were intimidating, yeah. And Susan Hockfield also went there. So it's, it's, it's really a very interesting place for MIT connections. But actually, let's start on that to begin with, Brad. You weren't the first person in your family to go to MIT, were oh, you? No, by the way, and the founder of, uh, originator of Android, too, was a high school grad of ours. So. And the yep. founder of Netflix. Yeah. It's a prolific place. It is. <laughs> Doesn't produce uh, um, professional athletes, though, other than <laughs> Bill Olet. He, he actually is a professional basketball player. So. Yeah. So about your family, I think this is going to be relevant to the whole story here. Tell us about you know, y your father going to MIT and, yeah. his, and what he did after MIT. Yeah, so I, so I think um, you all probably saw the, the movie The Graduate. Um, and if you haven't, go back to it and someone gives advice and says, you know, the future one word, it's plastics. And, and I would say my, my father went to MIT undergrad, which is much harder. I went graduate school, um, Sloan grad. And, uh, and he was uh, working for a company called Honeywell. And they decided to get into the computer industry, but he was in building controls. And if you think about what building controls is, that was, it's really today you'd call it Internet of Things. And, uh, and, and he absolutely wanted to get into computers, and he was from the Midwest. So he moved from California, which is unheard of today, to Detroit, Michigan, because that was the, that was the penultimate industry, American industry, the auto industry. And they were talking about applying. And he came home and told me about how they're going to, computers are going to be in cars. And they're going to be driving around in cars in 1960. So uh, I, I think I was definitely advantaged in, in just having a father who was creative and, and you know, was involved. And people have been talking about these things. But the timing is the important thing. The timing of when computers are going to change transportation, they're here now. So you know, it takes a long time for those things to happen. And what, what happened is the, the experience is similar to, to how I ended up in New York. Um, Wait, Brad, before you go there, I think it's important to just decompose this a little bit. When he went to Ford, I think the, the, the leader of Ford was? Lee Iacocca. Well, no, Lee Iacocca was the product leader for the Mustang, which was the iPhone of the auto industry. And if you go back and look at the advertising style, it was really about we're taking transportations, not utilitarian transportation actually is an experience. So um, this notion of you have industries that, that change based on a product. So he was applying linear programming and came up with a forecast. And he you know, was really, it was advanced analytics, nothing like we have today. No, it was nothing. Um, and he, so he presented his forecast to Lee Iacocca. And Lee Iacocca is smoking a cigar, and he said, Son, you're wrong. <laughs> We're going to sell a hell of a lot more of those things. And so, uh, so analytics was even there um, at the day. And he was totally wrong. And it probably was some poor soul was trying to tell S Steve Jobs how many uh, iPhones they were going to sell. And so, you, so you get your father, MIT graduate, goes and works in Honeywell, then goes, gets called to Ford by a charismatic leader, sees how to revolutionize an industry. And then, and then something happened. Um, a fellow named John Reed, an MIT grad. He was the chairman of MIT. Um, he was this young guy, and he, and he flew to Michigan, and he said. Wait, how young was he? I think he was like 28 or 29, and he looked about 12. So, and, and so this was, so my father was older, and he was going to go work for someone. And he, and he said, no, 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 you're going to read about it in the Wall Street Journal. I'm going to be made the SVP at First National City Bank, the predecessor. And he's like, right, this guy's crazy. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, the next week, um, John Reed becomes SVP. And he, and he takes the thinking, the structured thinking, the, the, um, the, you know, a lot of what he picked up at MIT and says, I'm going to apply, I'm going to revolutionize and apply what you guys do in the auto industry to the financial services industry. So he was way out there. And so we moved, um, we moved back east. And, and I met Bill, and, uh, mm -hmm. and that, I, I think that experience coming from outside of an industry into an industry is one of the most powerful things, because you can take with it a new perspective, 
and everyone else is locked into what you do today, what you think your customers want, but you can, you can bring um, a, a different perspective to it. So, um, so I, before we leave that, because I, I love this analogy, you know, and, and then, <laughs> and then where were we going to school? Where was in the backyard of, yeah. of what, what was, what was up around Chappaqua? Some company big, that big blue. Yeah. But before we go there, I just want to go back to John Reed, your father, it's ATMs. It's ATMs. Right. That was the, that was the innovation at the time. That would be the blockchain of the day. That would be the iPhone of the day changing the access to your money. Your money was locked. You had access during bank hours. And they were trying to justify this on automating the lowest cost employee in the bank. They totally got it wrong. The benefit was you unlocked access, seven by 24 access to our funds, yeah. which enabled all the great things. It, it allowed um, people to not plan and limit their social life because they didn't have enough cash. You had to plan what you were gonna do Friday, Saturday, Sunday night based on how much cash you had and how much cash you could get out on Friday afternoon before four o'clock. Yeah. So, you know, think about it. So they got the business model wrong. The real model was, but, but John Reed um, actually was going to build, and, and Citigroup did. They had TTI out in Santa Monica. They built the first, some of the first ATMs, proprietary um, ATMs. And the first ones were, I remember them, it was just a toy. It was like And crazy. they weren't networked. That was yeah. the other thing. When we talk about blockchain, these were standalone, unnetworked devices. So there's some, there's some, um, start to think about these endpoints and a lot of our financial services today for clients are not really as networked as, as they could be, nor are they standardized in how you... And so how you just to complete it, John Reed goes on to great glory and Brad's father goes on to become a, a legend on Wall Street for having done this, these dramatic changes in the industry. But now going back to your point, we're living up in Westchester County and the company is not Citibank, it's what? It's IBM. And, and every you know, good student, everyone that is really um, a, a, a great athlete, a great citizen uh, gets a job at IBM. And everyone, no, Bill, Bill got a job there. He started his I worked career. at IBM. They were the only ones that hired me. <laughs> um, but it was, it was interesting that um, you know, we, we knew everyone. We went to school with everyone. We, our parents didn't work there. We were a little bit of outsiders. So it gave you an interesting perspective that you know I always have had um, felt like a little bit of an outsider to IBM, having lived so close to the inside of IBM, and um, it's 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 allowed me to have a perspective. And certainly in financial services, IBM financial services alphanumeric data processing really lent itself to their architecture of the day. Financial services was one of the first industries along with the airline reservation systems that, that advanced the technology of the day, automated a lot of things, and that has gone on to become the biggest albatross for the financial services industry. The early success, the early automation has left us with an infrastructure that is incredibly, um, in many cases, a couple of generations behind, and it's always trying to preserve that that value that was created by automating, but the old architecture, as we know, is very tough to, to re-engineer while, while the engine is flying. I'll contrast that with financial services between the consumer and the, ent and the financial services. Incredible innovation that's gone on, and the financial services industry has done a great job of innovating there. Between the consumer, every communications innovation there's usually a couple of firms that are on the forefront, and the one that I worked for, Charles Schwab, had Chuck Schwab who understood this, and he had a big limitation, so he always adopted the, the most current, whether it was web, whether it was mobile, whether it was um, automated voice. USAA is the other one. USAA has no branches, so they have a major, they have a major limitation, and so they were in line for the original iPhone because they knew that iPhone was the equivalent of an ATM in, in, their, po in their customer's pocket. So the I think financial services has done a really good job of innovating um, between the customer because, number one, they can and because they have to. If you look behind inside of financial services and then you look on the, between the companies, the issuers, the companies, and financial services, that connection has not been 
um, has not had the modernization that it could. And so I think there's a massive industry that is going to be built when you figure out how you modernize that part of financial services. Because it's a very important industry, and it's, um, and it's ac absolutely an essential industry and will always be here. So the question is, what's going to happen there? But do you want to you come but back I, I to just a couple? Wanna, I just want to complete the narrative loop from you at a personal level. Your father, you see this with your father. You, you go out to the West Coast to go to, to undergraduate. Yep. You, you, know, you, 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 come, you come back to MIT, you get it, and you go back and you become kind of a serial CIO at places like Schwab and eBay. But you have this yellow thing in the sky called the sun on a regular basis. Yes, we do. And you're not doing, you're doing consumer stuff. You're not doing Wall Street stuff. Right. And what were the lessons you learned there? Well, I think some of the ones that, that I, 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 will, I want to credit MIT with probably the most, people say, did you ever learn anything in school, really? I would say I learned one of the most important things from uh, Robert Pindyke. And in the technical term is network externalities and positive networks effects, or just networks effects. And I learned about that, and I saw this company called Reuters that um, when foreign exchange went to floating rates, they were journalists, and they, were in the, they had nodes, and this is another concept. They had nodes around the world called media outpost journalists, and they were trusted. So they were given the prices for floating um, you know, exchange rates, and you had to pay them to take your prices, and then you had to pay to get the prices back. And all they did is sit in the middle and collect them, and then you subscribe to that business. And that's called the networks effects business, because the more people that had access to your prices and the more people that put their prices in, the more valuable the network is. That's the essential theory. So I learned that in, in graduate school, and I said, I always want to work for a company that has positive networks effects with underlying Moore's law of, of, of uh, the technology. So every time I look at changing a job or every time someone calls and says, do you want to do this job? I kind of go down the, is this a network? Does this have networks effects business? And that, you know, look at Uber. Look at eBay. eBay was basically a swap meet and a garage sale that was made, enabled globally by the fact that the more buyers, the more sellers you had, and the foundational network connectivity created a, you know, a massive business almost overnight. And that's happening, as, as you all know, you know, one after another, Facebook, Google, Uber. So network effects and NASDAQ, that doesn't exactly seem, it's hard to connect the dots. Um, can you connect the dots? I, you took this NASDAQ job. Why did you well, take Well, job? markets are a classic example of networks effects. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and NASDAQ was at a near-death experience. <clears throat> um, they were started, it was, it was, in 1971, it was the original FinTech company. It was a bunch of folks came together, computer scientists, and said, you know, it's kind of crazy what those people do down the street and wave their hands and uh, make signals and cut deals. You know, I think computers could probably do this a little bit better. But it was, think about the times, it was the same problem, what we talked about, the architecture was mainframe based. So they got it right that computers are gonna do this far better, far faster, far more accurately. Yeah. Um, and NASDAQ almost died um, because of the PC. And you go, how'd the PC ever kill it? And you had experience with the PC, Bill. The, the PC created a scaled architecture. There were so many components built that people started to you know, apply them to real things, and someone applied it to the stock market, and it was called Island or INET architecture, and it was a bunch of commodity PC-based computers, and everyone looked at it and said, that's not a real stock market. <laughs> that's, that's just this bunch of guys that hacked together something. But what they did is they created a new architecture. And, um, and NASDAQ almost went out of business. NASDAQ bought that company for a billion dollars. And we've improved that architecture, but fundamentally, that was you know, a next-gen architecture that, um, that created the ability to, uh, to, have, to have a market continue to have networks effects and to continue to live. And I think the, the, the first thing in these, when you see successful transformations, 
you know, arguably, you know, there's so many. And that was a near things. death successful yeah. transformation. Yeah. yeah. And so, so the you, CEO took control and, and, and made that happen. Yeah, which Bob deserves a tremendous amount yes, of credit for. Absolutely. And then he brought you in. But these successful transitions can be made or they cannot not be made. Um, it's good to have a near death experience to create that crisis as, as a organizational design group will talk about. And you can never let your guard down because there's another one coming. I think that's the lesson. Right. The smartphone um, ecosystem. So um, Andreessen Horowitz, a partner, had a great slide. He, he said he had a drone. And he said it's a flying smartphone. And and if you think about the componentry that enabled a drone to to really exist, the, the lightweight, the the communication link, the um, the, the gyro, the, um, the GPS, that's, that's really true. So we should be all a little bit on edge that the PC infrastructure that almost killed a lot of companies and created a lot of these business models, there's a new person in town that's called the smartphone and they're likely going to unlock some, some pretty interesting peer-to-peer -peer distributed, secure, highly connected, micro small nodes that um, that might be applied to something like fintech so think about that and I, and I think it's interesting to just point out here is that you know the classic case of you know what business were the railroads in they thought they were in the railroad business yep. where in fact they were in the transportation business how you frame the problem is very important and it was very interesting when you frame the problem as to what business is NAS the NASDAQ in and I think that's a that's a headline of this talk can you, can you just what business is NASDAQ in? So, so we are officially a fintech company. So we are a financial technology company. Um, we have a lot of work on our branding, but we do not consider ourselves a, a stock market. Um, and I think that helps you think about our opportunity, our future very differently so we don't become a, a, a railroad company and, and we miss the the next innovation in, in transportation. That to me is the headline, is NASDAQ is not a stock market company. It's not, NASDAQ is not a stock market, it's a we fintech, a fintech company. company. And Absolutely. so now all of a sudden that changes everyone's perspective on what you're doing. And can you give us specific examples how that changes your perspective? Yeah, a couple, a couple things. But um, even the funny story about how we, how we got interested in, in Bitcoin. So um, I arrived three and a half years ago Bill just met some of our R&D team. They're from Bell Labs. They're from telecommunications, as I have a telecommunications background. Um, so we think about things in terms of networks. So we're very much um, interested in that. They said, what do you think of Bitcoin? And I'm like, not, not that much. I'm trying to learn my job here. <laughs> so they were already kind of interested in Bitcoin. And then we have this business called Market Technology, where we are the technology provider as a competitor to um, in-house builds for, for other markets around the world. So we're the leading provider of, of trading, risk management, um, uh, post-trade technology. So we actually have, have a pure technology business. And one of the Bitcoin exchanges knocked on the door and said, can we use your, your technology for trading Bitcoin? And, and the sales guy came back and said, what's Bitcoin? And, and as we looked under the cover, so we were listening, the customers started to say, let's apply this technology that exists today to a different problem. And we're seeing that more and more, that um, loyalty points, um, advertising. So there's, we're right on the cusp of, as you miniaturize, and now think about this, this, this notion of a market in, in a very small spot. It doesn't have to be in a big data center you can start to dynamically trade and dynamically price almost any resource on earth. Yeah. And that, that fits very nicely into maybe what we are as an API business into um, an order book. And we have millions of things, whether they're stocks or they're parking spots, but you just hit our API because we have a scaled API for doing an order book. And it's um, interesting when you talk about the trading element of all the things you do, I was surprised that that's not the dominant part of it, is it? Right. No, it's all. It's building the applications on top of that, on that core foundation. Which, which was quite an insight. Um, some other things here, you know, Stripe. This is a company started by some MIT guys. It's on fire. Can, can you explain why Stripe is is 
so hot right now and where the future could lead? Mm -hmm. So for us, Stripe, um, maybe we should describe what Stripe is. How many of you know what Stripe is? And, and even if you know what Stripe is, I'm not sure we really know where Stripe is going. I think they're yeah. pretty brilliant. They're, they're iterating pretty quickly. But do you want to? No. Okay. Why don't you tell them? All right. <laughs> um, I'm not a fintech person. <laughs> Well, well so, so we have NASDAQ private market where we're interested in companies that are going to grow up and then ultimately our traditional, another part of our business is you grow up, you list, you, t you do an IPO, you become a public company on NASDAQ. So NASDAQ private market is all about the companies live a lot longer in the private space. So we saw a problem when we built Link that you guys have probably read about on blockchain to demonstrate that, to, to um, just facilitate trading of private securities and, and solve a lot of problems. Stripe, I think, is taking the formation of a company and making it so that you can actually start a company very quickly. So this notion of all the pain that you have in getting, and I, and I think it started from just becoming um, a pay, almost like what PayPal solved. PayPal saw a lot of small businesses couldn't even get a merchant account. Um, Stripe is taking that to the next level to make it, um, you can almost get all of that business creation um, done overnight or instantaneously. Yeah. And that takes so much friction out of um, a lot of the entrepreneur and, and, the, and, and for every company that wants to, um, that has a great idea and they don't want to waste their resource on all the administrative things of that. So we think Stripe could be very complementary to us, what we do with NASDAQ private market. But they could also, they're very talented, they could also go, hey, we can do that too. So they could, they could pivot and, and be right in our backyard overnight. And I think they're that talented that they're going to go solve a problem that, that exists. And right now they're solving that one. Um, anyone else have another version of what Stripe is, is, is potentially doing that's, that's earth shattering? Maybe we got it right. To, to me, Stripe is just kind of this they started with nothing, and they said, what is, what is absolutely essential for a small business to, to do e-commerce? Yeah. And they built up from there. And, and like you said, you know, we were joking about the first question I was going to ask him. So, 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 Brad, how's it going with tying those ma mainframe computers to your slide rules and your abacus? <laughs> um, uh, there's, no, there's no legacy for them. They start with tableau or Aze, and then they can just build up only what's essential and only add those other things, which creates enormous efficiency. And, they're, and, and they've gotten off to a good start. Was, and, it, was it Simon that said that it, it first looks like a toy? Yeah. Yeah, so think about some of these companies. Um, you had a big company called Commerce One that was going to knit together the auto industry supply chain into a network where they would sell and buy from each other. And then Commerce One sold to the airline parts um, supply chain and it was this fabulous thing and it went bankrupt and there was a company that sold Beanie Babies and and Pez dispensers and it was just kind of silliness yeah. and that one ended up being the one that sells more cars and sells very complicated earth moving machines called eBay and and I think that is um, Simon's point about it first looks like a toy yeah. And I think Stripe said, we're going to go in small business. No one wants to serve small business. Yeah. And if you get the infrastructure right, that rolls on to medium-sized business, and that rolls on to large-sized business. And every, the incumbents go, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, it's just like ATMs. We were talking about that before. The ATMs, the first time you saw it, you go, this is crazy. This is never going to work. Ignore it. Yeah. But then it catches up to you. And now the ATM's been, you've taken it and taken every function and put it out and, and everyone that has an ATM network, it's what was a revolution is now an albatross. It's a huge cost structure. There's hundreds of people. There's hundreds of millions of dollars of modernizing your ATM network. And yet, how many people, the declining transactions of, of ATMs is coming down and it's going to come down like a rocket. So then what do you do to decommission that? If you have five of them, and you go to four, and you go to three, you still have to send someone out, they have to clean it, they have to put cash in it. So that is, that is the problem of if you're too early and if you build up too much scale, 
you become vulnerable to the next thing, which the iPhone, the debit card, and at retail, all that is making that infrastructure not as valuable as it was initially. I want to just ask you a, a, a few, uh, I guess, provocative questions that not representing NASDAQ, but just your personal opinion as an MIT alumni. Um, what do you think about New York City as a place for fintech? I mean, you came back from California to here. Your father did before you. You've come, yeah. come back here. With the way technology is going, do you have to be in New York? Is fintech going to be based in New York and London? What's the role of Boston? Is, or is it going to be spread out as a world? So class, this is like my Trump? personal, because I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I would take an MIT professor to analyze this and structure it. Mm -hmm. But just from a, from where I sit, seeing, spending a lot of time in Boston, spending a lot of time in, in San Francisco and New York, and not having as much of a global view as I should, I would say. So let me start there, because I think there's, there's important places that will occur around the world. But just talking about the US. Do you want everyone to sign a non-disclaimer form here as no, well? No, I'm just trying to, I'm trying just to. Just get to your damn opinion, will you? I'm trying to. <laughs> um, so, so I think you look where the talent goes, and that was, who mentioned that before about, you know, look where the software engineers are going. Yeah. I, I think the generation that is going to re-engineer financial services likes to live in cities and exciting cities. Yeah. And, and I still think Boston, San Francisco, and New York have a huge advantage over every other city in the United States. Yeah over Chicago, over Austin. If you've been to Austin, it's not San Francisco. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Charlotte, it was All right, I think there. you ought to stop now, Brad. <laughs> I've dug myself in. So it is going to be New York. We have alumni in Austin. <laughs> so fire up the q and Austin's a great place. It's always the second place when, when your company uh, is successful. You move to Austin. <laughs> you know you've made it if you have a All place right, Brad, let's get back to the technical right. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I clearly am not a demographer. <laughs> blockchain, you know, again, your personal opinion, where's blockchain going? We've heard great talks by, you know, Simon, we've heard great, great talk by Christian. Well, very well done, Christian. Where do you see blockchain? And someone else asked this morning, is this real? I mean, uh, the question was, you know, we've all seen things. Video text, remember, video text was going to take over the world. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. And Bitcoin was going to take over the world. Um, yeah, but now where, you're, now you're, now you're you buy taking the wind them? out of it. Um, when you say video text versus, is, is video text really your vision was the internet? Mm -hmm. so, so I think if video, if video text was just the timing was wrong, but they kind of had the concept that you're going to have direct high graphic communication out right, to the I, home. I, I need to stop you because none of these people, except you and I, know what video Because IBM, was, was, <laughs> IBM missed it famously with, with Sears, I think. All right, let's know. focus on blockchain all right. now, all right? <laughs> What's your crystal ball tell you about blockchain from A, a technological development standpoint, and B, a market standpoint? Well, I, I think the, the, the advantage blockchain has is it has gone all the way to the boardroom. Mm -hmm. And it is it has opened up the dialogue about the need to modernize what I talked about as the core infrastructure of financial services. I think that's one thing. I think Simon talked about, um, or is it Antoinette, about the change of the intermediaries. Mm -hmm. Yes, Simon. And and how it how it comes into you have. I, I mean, we're all still studying this about how disruption. Is it offensive, is it defensive, and who wins? So the incumbents win, usually the defensive one, the offensive one, the, the next generation um, companies win, win those. It, I don't know which one, which one ends up doing it, but it is going to be the foundational concepts of what blockchain brings and, and incorporates a lot of the things from telecommunications like, that Skype brought. You know, Skype took the, a platform and allowed you to do video and phone calling at higher quality than the phone companies did. And they did it at an incredible price point, which, which really caused a change in the, tele, in the incumbent telecommunications networks. So there's security innovations combined with peer-to-peer. -peer, and when you combine those things together, they're f a far different architecture. And it's almost like what INET was to the 
the mainframe of, of the trading companies. So blockchain has, has caused everyone to think differently about architecture and has also um, put it at a level where companies are willing to say, I better get going on, on modernizing and having a role in this. So I think it's absolutely timing-wise. I still haven't got that. And maybe in, next time we're up here, if we do this conference next year, we can start to talk about timing. But I am absolutely convinced that um, we are, we're on to something here. Mm -hmm. Will it consolidate the market? Will it be like Google with the advertising market where the, the bell curve is just shrunk down to one person wins in blockchain? Or will it? No, I don't will, think it's one person. It? But I will make a prediction um, that it is going to be a massive market. Um, there's going to be a massive company created um, by this and a rewiring of the intermediaries. So my, my principle is that the endpoints always exist. So you always have an investor. Ultimately, there's an investor in financial services or a customer, and there's an issuer or a company. And everything in the middle is open season, mm -hmm. including, uh, including us. You know? So everyone that lives in the middle has to be paying attention to what is the connecting point because companies really want to talk to the end investor. They really do. And they want to know, they want to tell the, the end investor what stage they're at. And when they're at seed stage, it's a different investor oftentimes than when they're a large, successful private company to when they're a hyper growth public company to when they're a maturing, you know, dividend paying company. And you need to manage that communication. That's what the intermediaries intermediaries have done because you didn't have technology to do it. A lot of it was people-based. It's becoming more and more automated, but it can become direct. So there's no reason why the things we have can't be a direct communication to the investments we have. And, uh, and, and then the, the fact that machine intelligence comes into that to make a lot of the human decisioning about your portfolio more sophisticated, more scalable, and um, I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. That's why I'm actually right in the middle of it at this point. I'm, I'm on the issuer side, though, so it's, it's really fascinating. I, I understand the investor side from Schwab and from PayPal and my experience. And now I'm looking at it from what are the problems that, that the company has. And we happen to have a lot of those companies because they're listed on NASDAQ in the US and they're listed on our exchanges in, um, in the Nordic companies. So we have a real reason to just listen and understand what they would prefer, what CEOs want to prefer, what, what the CFO, the invest, investor relations. So we're really doing what USAA does. We're listening to our customers. We're looking for opportunity, and we're trying to survive. We're trying to be a little paranoid. Oh, great. We have time for questions now. I have more questions, but we'll welcome questions from the audience. I would just ask that, as I always say in Cambridge, that questions end with a question mark. All right. <laughs> right. Thank you, uh, Brad. About what percentage of Nasdaq's uh, revenues and earnings are based on selling technology to other markets? Um, we uh, to to other markets. So we we have technology businesses that also tell sell technology to those issuers or those companies. We have about eighteen thousand, and that's. That's about 400 million there, and we have a little over 200 million um, on the on the um, infrastructure side, and the company's about 2.1 billion. So you can kind of do the it's a math-based crowd. You guys can yeah, and yes, the, that's a that's very sizable. Yeah, it's a sizable. It, and if you think about it, a half a billion dollar over a half a billion dollar technology company is a pretty decent sized one. You could also think about, and it's helpful to think about what we do for, for what used to be called an exchange is really an early instance of a uh, cloud with APIs. So we have very high speed, we have very high speed input. You order, order entry and market data output. And that is, um, you know, that's all run in our cloud, if you will. So we are a cloud. We take the same software that we sell to exchanges, and we host it ourselves. And you can buy it by the transaction, if you will. So when you start to look at it that way, 
the core of the company and the core, um, of, and that's why you know our our CEO, our COO, Adina Friedman. Um, you'll if you if you tune into her, she's talking about about fintech and 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 why technology is at the core of of, of the future of the company. There's another question. Back that's back to the headline. Nasdaq isn't a stock exchange; it's a fintech company. Yep. Yes. Hi. Can you Do you hear mind me? standing up? Show us your uh, yeah, communication I skills. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, I have a thousand questions for you. Just going to ask one. Um, you mentioned just right now about the cloud, but what about these companies that have been there like for a thousand years? They want to switch, like I don't know, um, let's say a bank, and they want to just go to fintech, but they still have a lot, a lot of legacy. They have like I don't know, twenty mainframes. They have mid range or whatever. Do they really need to start from scratch? Because there's a lot of stuff they need to still maintain, right? Like it's a good idea, like to just, you know, throw all the legacy away. I, I know that's not an answer, but yeah, yeah. So that is a long question about how do you get out from under a, a mainframe is is a different legacy, topic. Legacy, yeah, no. yeah. You need to keep maintain that. But. Yeah, I know. That's so. That was one of the. I did want to take one issue with the big bubble that said this is the IT budget and this is the VC budget and this is. I think yeah. I can't remember what the smaller one was. That big bubble, the IT budget of the big banks, um, is not. Not much is innovation. Most of it is keeping things going, and most of it is polishing the, or rearranging, as you said. Seats yeah, on the Titanic, said. polishing the brass on the Titanic. Uh, yeah. So okay. the, that the size of the number is not is not indicative of 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 the innovation. So I would say that one is that one is an example of like the ATM, somewhat of an albatross. To replace all that is daunting. It, so and, it's, and that's why it hasn't been done. It's not, it, it is really a hard job and whoever has that job, it is, it is a puzzle. And we were fortunate enough to be small enough that we, we have no mainframes at all and we were able to adopt this new, this new architecture. And I've worked at companies that have no mainframe and it is, a, it is just wonderful. And it, you don't know how much stress having People who are, you know, at the end of their career have the critical skills, and there's no way to bring that back, and there's no hope of getting off it either. I think that is, it, it's really a high risk endeavor in one of our most critical industries. Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit before us how, when you're in a large company, it's so hard to, to reinvent yourself and get rid of the legacy. What, what, what my chat, when I, well, my, my first real big job at IBM was the personal computer. And it, people are, w won't probably believe this, but there was a major investment at IBM to try to port the mainframe operating system to the personal computer. It was called XT370. You're shaking your head. And I did that announcement. I tried to explain them. This, isn't, this is not worth doing. You can't take a mainframe operating system and put on a personal computer. But the entrenched... Uh, forces inside the company were forcing this so much. And, and you wonder, how is it ever possible? Yet you have seen it at NASDAQ, you've seen it at Apple. Steve Jobs just said, you know, uh, very aggressively, we're, we're going to you know, kill the desktop business, we're going to be getting into the mobile business, you know, we're going to kill the, the Apple IIe. People forget how successful the Apple IIe was, and we're going to move to the iMac. It was first the Lisa and then the iMac. But a lot of times it involves near-death experiences. And that's that's kind of what happened in your situation. Yeah, and fortunately, yeah, I, it would. Ha fortunately, it happened before I got there. I probably wouldn't have gone if it hadn't happened. Yeah, if you couldn't make payroll, it's not a very good company. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think this. Uh, oh, we're uh, we're done. I'm sorry. And, and Brad has to get to the uh, airport. So Brad, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Yep. <laughs> keep. Keep, sneak off, uh, keep doing what you're doing. I, you're making MIT proud, and I, you're doing great things for the economy. Yeah, and I want to say thank you to everyone. I do live in New York City now. I am going to fly to Los Angeles for a personal um, event, family event. So for those of you that I didn't get a chance to meet, I apologize, but I am local to New York, so, um, so look me up. And he's going to spend a lot of time up in Cambridge. Absolutely. <laughs> Always do. Thanks, Brad. Thanks. All right. Great to see you.